This is American Government on Monday, October 5th, 2020. Uh, just a reminder that on Wednesday, we'll turn to the Electoral College as the next institution uh, under the Constitution. <clears throat> For my, uh, I sent out my handout on the Electoral College, which is also posted on Canvas, and we'll uh, discuss that. And our main goal on Wednesday is to see how the Electoral College was supposed to work. It was designed by the founders and how it actually does work today. On Friday, we'll look at some developments within the Electoral College and its effect on the presidential race. And on Monday, we'll turn to Martin Diamond's article on the Electoral College and raise the question of whether the Electoral College should be abolished or preserved. Um, our next midterm will be on Monday, on Wednesday, October 14th, including the material on Converse, Congress that we started last Wednesday and Friday and will conclude today and the Electoral College. So we uh, looked at the original design of Congress as the framers planned it and as it was explained in the Federalist Papers. We've seen how Congress developed as an institution both with respect to changes in the larger national government but also internally with the development of its critical structures such as the committee system, the party system, and staff. And so today, we'll turn to the question of contemporary criticisms and issues of Congress. Um, to go back to the very beginning, and as Wilson starts out in Chapter 9, pointing out that Congress is the least popular national institution in American politics and much of society. So the way I would form the question is, then, what are the kinds of criticisms that people make of Congress? Um, is it as bad as uh, the American people think? Two of the authors that Connolly refers to actually have published two books critical of Congress uh, since the early 2000s, Thomas Mann and um, uh, um, just blanked on this other's name. Hold on one second. This is what it means to be 68 years old. Uh, Norm Ornstein, sorry. So Thomas Mann and Norm Ornstein. Uh, uh, their more recent book, published about five years ago, was Congress is the Broken Branch. Actually, a little earlier, come to think of it. Um, so the broken branch, the branch that isn't working the way it's supposed to work. Um, no, that was their earlier book. Their second book is um, It's Even Worse Than It Looks. So uh, here are two political scientists that agree with uh, uh, the American people that the Congress is the broken or dysfunctional branch. Um, <clears throat> so, again, why is it so unpopular? What kind of criticisms? This is, a, as I mentioned in the notes, it's a hodgepodge. Here's a kind of a medley of the kinds of criticisms that people make of Congress, that it can't really reflect upon or attain the common good of the national interest, that it's too bound up, each member of the House and the Senate are too bound up with campaigning and raising money, um, that uh, special interests are too influential um, within Congress. This is Fiorino, and uh, and in some ways, one way of describing his article on the Washington establishment, the rise of the Washington establishment, from his larger book, Congress is the Keystone of the Washington Establishment, is that Congress is a collection of self-serving re-election addicts, providing what constituents and special interests desire. If you look on the accompanying uh, uh, chart or, or picture that I uh, sent out with the notes, the triangle. Um, this is what, what uh, 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 Fiorino calls the Washington establishment. Um, it's the kind of permanent set of Washington interests that kind of form what some sci political scientists call iron triangles, where one corner of the triangle provides what the other corner needs in that in the other corner, and it's kind of a circular process or triangular process. Um, you could say it's also what, in some ways, is colloquially referred to as the swamp. Um, um, but but the three points of the triangle, and this is Fiorino's analysis, but it's not confined to Fiorino, is that there's the permanent bureaucracy. Oh, let's start with the linchpin, the, the, the Keystone Congress. Uh, Congress creates the bureaucracy and the programs which the bureaucracy administers. The interests of the bureaucracy are to expand their power and privilege, preserve their bureaucratic power, uh, which they have to do by attending to the request for hearings and uh, legislative authority and monetary authority of Congress. 
But then there's the voters, the constituents who like the pork barrel. That's the legislation that members of Congress, representatives and senators vote on, not because the country needs it, because it's good for the district. Um, the, the federal military installations, the bridges, the uh, uh, power plants that, uh, and other projects, and, and, and even for that matter, some aspects of welfare programs which are directed to benefits to constituents. So, um, so, and then congressmen support those, bring them back to the district, and so that wins their reelection. So at the base of the system, or the core corner of the system, is members of Congress seeking reelection. As Connolly reports, current um, uh, there's current disaffection. This goes back about 20 years, you could say, but it's gotten worse in some ways in the last 10 years, the last five years, perhaps the last three years. Gridlock. Gridlock, you know, is a term that comes from traffic. And when uh, traffic on highways is locked and can't move, and the suggestion is is that Congress is so beset with partisanship and partisan squabbling and and, and territorial and uh, individual and geographical interests, the factions that Madison talks about in Federalist Ten, that it can't it can't act can't act on the national good. Uh, and in general, that, that Congress is more like a squabbling mud fight with politicians at each other's throats. That's kind of like a medley of the disaffection and criticism that people have. So I would, in order to finish this, this part of reflection on Congress, I would turn that medley into a broader question. So if the, if the, the, the medley is Congress is worse than it looks, it's bad as, as, bad as, uh, or worse than it looks, to does Congress need reform? That's the way I would then, is Congress so dysfunctional that something should be done about the institution? Does it need reform? Does it, and what kinds of reforms does it need? I, I've thought about this question a long time. I've organized both this part of the course in Introductory American Government, but also my upper level course on Congress then. Around, around four broad answers to that question. Does Congress need reform? And you'll see that there's one no answer. No, things are, are as they should be, messy as they look and are. And then three yes questions. And the way I explained it in the notes is um, there's, there's the answer that no, Congress doesn't need reform. That's In our readings, I think that's Bill Connolly, William Connolly. Obviously, the title of his article is Congress is Not the Broken Branch. But also uh, Wasaki, who, who, uh, in his complex and interesting article, kind of makes the argument that Congress has dug its own grave in this respect, but that, uh, but that the essence is not so much how Congress operates, really, but rather the rhetoric that Congress has crafted to explain itself and issues of national politics. More about about his interesting article in a, in a minute. Um, then the second position is it is a yes some reform um some institutional reform not constitutional you'll see i distinguish between um the first yes answer some reform from the other two uh, yes answers and the other two yes answers as you'll see involve uh some kind of constitutional adjustment of the institution um what's the difference between so so the next three positions are yes positions what i call yes some reform Yes, big reform, although ironically minor constitutional, and yes, really big reform, which is major constitutional. The difference between the three reform uh, positions is is with with minor with yes some with being institutional reform is is there the argument is Congress could still use its internal processes and legislative process. Um, to make changes in either elections or internal structures so as to improve the institution. The other two, inst the other two, the minor constitutional, uh, yes, big, and yes, really big, major constitutional, the presumption of those two positions is that Congress is too corrupt uh, to change itself and therefore change has to come from outside um, the institution. Uh, probably from some kind of process of constitutional amendment. And remember, when we looked at the Constitution in Article 5, <clears throat> remember that the motion for reform or amendment can either come within Congress, 
Remember, there are two forms of proposing amendments within Article 5. Two-thirds of both houses of Congress um, uh, propose an amendment, uh, and then it goes to the states, either the legislatures or the conventions for ratification. But the other method of initiate, initiating or proposing amendments, which has never been activated since the founding, is that two-thirds of the states call for a convention to propose amendments. So there are ways of initiating the amendment process that circumvent Congress or go around it. So uh, as you'll see, the two, the two substantial reform positions are alike in that they suggest that Congress can't reform itself. Reform has to come from outside, probably some kind of constitutional amendment process. So let's look at the four positions. The first position is no, Congress doesn't need reform. It's fine. It's the way it is. Um, and the two authors, again, uh, Wilson, I think, in Chapter 9, although he articulates the criticisms, I think probably uh, uh, Wilson and his com and patriots actually believe that Congress is essentially functioning uh, properly. So uh, what's this criticism, or what, what is this position? The position is this Congress is operating okay. It's not a pretty sight, uh, but it wasn't designed to be a pretty sight. You already get the impression, and, and, and you'll see in Connolly, for instance, Connolly relies heavily on Federalist 10 that we read earlier in the founding period. And the founding, and remember, the premise of Federalist 10 is that human society is messy. It's beset by factions. And in a free society with free elections, those factions are likely to be represented within uh, the um, the composition of the legislature. So, um, so the suggestion is, is Congress... According to constitutional design, it was never supposed to look like a Tea Party. Um, no reference to the political movement that started in 2010. Um, but so the argument is, is Congress probably was always designed to be not the broken branch, but at least the messy branch. And don't forget, it's bicameral. So there are often conflicts between the House and Senate. The separation of powers means that there are often conflicts between Congress and the president. And the federal system means that there are, are also conflicts between the national government and the states or among the states and localities within the states. Congress is the institution where all of those divisions in American society come out. So in a way, Connolly makes that argument that, um, that it's the constitutional design of Congress uh, inclines to the kind of images that we see in its processes. And Connolly goes so fur farther, further to say that the design of the Constitution still governs the behavior of an institution. The bicameral intentions that we saw reflected in Federalist, the Federalist 50s and 60s on the House and the Senate that we read last week, as argument is, are still described the behavior of individual congressmen in the institution. So uh, there are several versions or aspects of this position, and everyone who kind of is in this group don't necessarily share them all. But it's worth looking at different varieties of, of the no reform argument that Congress is fine. First of all, there are some scholars, uh, Michael Robinson, if you want to uh, check these out online, uh, <clears throat> um, who has a fine article from the late 90s, but it's still relevant, called The Three Faces of Congressional Media. And in it, he makes this argument, but he's not alone in this. And to some degree, this is kind of Connolly and Masaki. But some political scientists and observers argue that the American people's um, lack of love for their national legislature, uh, but love, remember, of their local representative or senator, because don't forget, at the same time that Congress is, as an institution's approval rating has gone down, the rate of incumbency of re-election, especially of members of the House, now goes, as we saw in class on Friday, uh, between 92 to 98 percent, depending on the election and some of the issues. Um, so uh, remember, America hate uh, Americans hate their Congress, but they love their member of Congress, their local members of Congress. Um, so it, the argument is that that's not essentially an operational or a true institutional problem. It's an image or a media problem, and and this is how this position unfolds. The argument is that since the Watergate affair in the 1970s that culminated with President Nixon's resignation on August 9th, uh, 1974. Um, is that the national media have changed in the way in their attitude towards and reporting of national politics and the institutions of national government. Uh, the media uh, 
may have a love or hate relationship with a particular president. But generally speaking, the argument is since Watergate and the 70s, that the national media have become more critical, more adversarial, uh, uh, attending more to the negative aspects of national government, more scandal oriented, because in some ways, the argument is, uh, since the founders believed that all institutions and human beings have a certain amount of self-interest, it's in the self-interest of the media to generate uh, uh, viewers and readership by reporting controversial, scandalous things. So the suggestion is, is that whereas media coverage of our international institutions was more favorable up to this point, since then it's become, as again, more scandal-oriented and negative. At the same time, interestingly enough, that local media... Uh, operate differently with respect to the individual members of Congress. Local media, unlike the national media, which are, are driven by events and everything, and, and to some degree have, have national followings, local media are more dependent upon sources, especially local congressional sources, for news feed for their stories. And they tend to pay, present a more favorable image of local representatives. Plus, don't forget the campaign apparatus of candidates operates on the local level. So, uh, and as um, uh, Wilson discusses in Chapter Nine, the ranking privilege, uh, members of Congress get lot, get get subsidized to actually send out mailings to their constituents. That's part of the informing function, but obviously there's some amount of self promotion that goes on. So the argument is the media image of local members of Congress, unless there's some local conference controversy or, sc or scandal going on. Like, for instance, in North Carolina, the two senatorial candidates, there's a question of, of the incumbents, Tom Tillis's um, 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 uh, uh, closeness to uh, the pharmaceutical industry and subsidies and campaign contributions and, and his voting. And there's that, that sort of, that's been high profile in the North Carolina media. But then also, um, uh, the uh his his opponent dan cunningham uh there's some scandal about sexting and texting a democratic operative and so on one level unless there's some scan local scandal dimension or some local issue that that provides a strong stream of negativity towards a candidate the local media tend to be favorable so in some ways this media or image explanation tries to explain why americans don't see the institution they like on the national level or they see an institution they don't like and yet they're so the the irony between disliking the institution but liking their local member so there's this media explanation uh not everyone agrees with that but uh but the argument is again congress is actually operating fine it's just the american people don't see it or 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 are unaware of it because of the negative coverage of the national media and and by the way there may be an, some explanatory value in that in explaining why incumbency for local members is up, the individual members, but not, but, but the institution itself remains negative. Um, as I say in my notes, this is a partial explanation as to the rise of incumbency. There's a, a, a second and a deeper one, which is B in the notes, and that the argument is that Congress, not so much that yeah, Congress's function has changed, but particularly the, the function and role of individual members of Congress, especially representatives, but senators too has changed. Um, and this is most re reflected in, I think, Fiorino, the Congress, the rise of the Washington establishment, the key, or from his book, as I mentioned earlier, the keystone of the Washington establishment. Now, uh, Fiorino says, well, there's always been, what, what was the purpose of, of, of uh, the Congress in its original design? It was to represent, of course, local interests and state interests, but also in some ways to be the national legislative body. So uh, uh, debating and, and reflecting local opinion and, and representing um, uh, your constituents' passions and interests with their opinions uh, is sort of like partisan or ideological debate about the national good. Legislating, lawmaking always was a critical function. But since the rise of the national government and expansion of the national government, and the addition of the role of providing funding for and distributing national revenue across the nation, and the expansion of welfare and other bureaucratic pro programs with the activity of the federal government, the argument is, is according to Fiorino, is that two additional roles have become parallel to, in some ways, overwhelmed the lawmaking or representative function. 
and that's pork barrel, and that's uh, bringing home uh, federal largesse and generosity to your district in the form of projects like dam projects, road projects, uh, military installations, uh, sewage treatment projects, water treatment projects, all part of the expanded purview of the national government. But then congressmen and senators, representatives and senators, uh, have a tendency to want to pull that back to their district. That's pork barrel legislation. That would be like, for instance, tax breaks for milk farmers in Wisconsin versus tax credits for ethanol farmers in Iowa. It's not that there's a national good involved, although there may be an argument for that, but rather uh, there, these are federal programs and federal dispensation of funds and benefits that have local attachments. And so members of Congress struggle with each other, compete with each other to bring that stuff back to their district. Now, of course, um, those are often good things, but the argument is, is that if you're only attending to the good of your district, you're not paying attention to the long range good. And then, of course, the other um, element is what's called casework. And Wilson also has a good description of this function, that with the rise of the welfare state and the massive federal bureaucracy, which gets more and more complex and more opaque and more difficult for the public to understand and scrutiny, members of Congress often become ombudsmen of special pleaders where, where, where members of their constituencies um, have issues with, with obtaining benefits or navigating the complex bureaucracy, they turn to members of Congress as assistants. And as Free Reno points out, since members of Congress both create the legislation that authorizes the programs that bureaucrats administer, but then also uh, scrutinize the funding because all funds in the U.S. Treasury have to be dispensed by Congress, according to Article 1, Section 9. So um, the argument here is, is members of Congress have kind of become um, this is and this is his free and his core argument that um, that their function is not so much representing their uh, um, uh, constituents' opinions on complex national issues because on complex national issues, controversial national issues, you're going to have you're going to have members of your constituency who support, like on the question of abortion, it, it divides the American people. So if you take a vote on a controversial abortion legislation or something like this, that you're going to alienate some of your constituents and, and, and therefore get some opposition generated to a vote. So Fiorino argues that's why members of Congress have moved more towards this pork barrel and casework, because that's less controversial and it, it contributes in, in Fiorino's kind of uh, colorful, blunt language. It's the currency of reelection. So it's a way of, of currying favor with some or all of your constituents without putting your stamp on controversial issues. So in a way, um, the problem is, as you could argue, is that Congress loses sight of the national good or the long range good and perhaps the best issue, which is an issue that doesn't get, although this year may be because of the additional spending, the argument is our and let me introduce a term we'll come back to later on in the course when we talk about policy making, but it's uh, the question of the national deficit and the debt. Remember, in the budget of the United States or any other entity, if you spend more than you take in, you're going to be running at a deficit. You're going to be running in the red. That's true of a person, a company, a nation. So um, ever since the 1970s, the U.S. Gen generally has accumulated a national and annual deficit. But if you don't pay off that deficit, the debt begins to accumulate. At the beginning of the century, the 2000, 21st century, the debt of the United States had accumulated to about $5 trillion. Now, the U.S. economy is so big that the accumulated debt of the United States was relatively trivial. Even then, $5 trillion is a lot of money. But at the beginning of this year, 2020, the debt was about $21 to $22 trillion. It's estimated that our deficit this year, because of the spending on the pandemic and other things, will accumulate to close to three to six trillion dollars by the end of the year, which means that by the end of 2020 and the beginning of 21, the accumulated debt of the United States um, will be close to 27 to 30 trillion dollars. And whoever wins the election in November both sides, both Republicans and Democrats, have contributed to the accumulation of this debt. Now, there comes a point where 
If you have too much debt, it will destroy you. That's true of an individual. If you have too much credit card debt accumulated, paying the interest on that debt will eventually be eat up your ability to spend on the things you want to spend on, your family, your, 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 your pleasures, whatever. That's true of debtor nations like Argentina and Greece, and people don't think of the United States as a debtor nation. But if we continue spending and we accumulate a debt, that's not going to be a problem for me. I'm 68 years old and I'm going to be retiring, and you're going to be paying my Social Security until I uh, kick the bucket. But it probably will be a problem for you, you young people in your 20s, as you move into adulthood, and especially your grandchildren. Um, how will 70% of the federal budget, when we talk later on in the course about budgeting and policymaking, 70% of the federal budget is on welfare programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and other welfare assistance. Uh, the military budget has shrunk to about 9 to 10%. There's some other dis discretionary spending, and interest on the debt is about 5 to 8% right now. But if we continue growing a debt like this and don't pay it down, the interest on the debt will eventually come to eat up the bulk of the federal uh, uh, outlays. So uh, why can't Congress deal with this? Both parties seem to be given to unlimited spending because they don't want to raise taxes or cut taxes or whatever we want to do. But the problem is, is, is if Fiorino is right, members of Congress don't look at the long-range good or the national good. They look at the, the short-range good of their interests and constituents. That may be. And that's a problem. Uh, so, um, uh, again, uh, Fiorino isn't just critical of Congress because he says, I think, that, I think he thinks this is a problem for Congress's acting on the national good. Um, but on the other hand, this is also something that Americans want. So, uh, uh, I think he suggests that, that this criticism, um, uh, is, uh, that Congress isn't attending the national good is a problematic one because, uh, to some degree, Americans have a love-hate relationship with the federal government, and they want more federal spending on their district, but they don't want their taxes raised. So in some ways, uh, the argument is 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 that uh, it's not so much that Congress is dysfunctional, it's responding to conflicting needs in the American people. Connolly's position is the most positive in this first no-reform position. His argument, and he would admit much of what we've seen in in uh, the criticisms, even in, in Fiorino's uh, piece, but his argument is, is that Congress is supposed to be attached to more local and special interest. If there's paralysis and polarization, gridlock, it may be more reflective of divisions within the American people. And therefore, since the Congress is representative of the American people, if there are fundamental tensions and conflicts and divisions within the people, that has to be reflected in Congress. But the framers anticipated that in the bicameral design and the local election and attachment of members, not to the nation. After all, we don't elect, we're not like a parliamentary system where the nation votes as a toll for the legislature. We vote in local districts, and therefore Congress represents those local districts. So in a way, as we've already seen before, um, uh, um, to put Connolly's position in, posi in, in the perspective, Congress isn't the broken branch. It's not the pretty branch, but it wasn't supposed to be, and therefore it's fulfilling its constitutional design. Wasaki's rather interesting article adds, I think he's in the no reform position, um, um, but his argument is that Congress has sort of created uh, uh, American cynicism about it by adopting what he calls crisis rhetoric. Now, he refers to the rise of the rhetorical presidency, and that is an article we're, we're going to be reading in a few weeks, connection with the presidency uh, by Tulis and others. It's in the Nichols Reader. And the suggestion is presidents have come to go govern more and more by, by suggesting crisis. Now, don't get me wrong. All authors and all observers and all Americans would agree there really are crises in the nation, like 9-11 or the Great Recession in 2008. There are such things as, as grave crises. But not every issue in the nation is a grave crisis. And Wasaki's argument is both referring to Tulis's argument is that both the president, but especially Congress, especially on um, um, it's my alarm going off, um, uh, that Cong members of Congress pushing certain reforms have tended to argue more and more that, that it's crisis driven. And there are two major problems with that. One is that you can't 
be in crisis mode all the time, sort of like the boy who cried wolf, because that may deprive you of governing authority when a real crisis arises, like a pandemic, uh, or uh, or like the 9-11 or World War II, um, or the Depression. Those are real crises. But if you keep it up all the time, then people become cynical about the possibility of governance that that uh, the and you destabilize the kind of uh, sense of normality that 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 normal times requires. Wasaki also suggests that it, those members of Congress, especially in the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1970, have adopted the notion that Congress requires reform all the time and that Congress should always be reforming itself. But if you're suggesting that, then you're suggesting that Congress is fundamentally defective or broken. So this constant reform rhetoric, which is part of national life to some degree since the 70s, may undermine Americans' ability to understand and appreciate their institutions. Not that the institutions could really be reformed to be operating better. Uh, probably they were operating as well as they could, given a modern representative democracy. But if Americans think that they need reform all the time, that may undermine that kind of approval that a certain amount of governing, normal governance requires. So the other three positions are reform positions, that, that Congress is in, to some degree dysfunctional and needs uh, fixing. Uh, so the second position is, yes, some reform, what I call institutional reform, which would primarily be through either the chambers referring, reforming themselves in their internal processes or like campaign finance. Now, a certain irony of campaign finance reform going back to the 1970s is, is generally speaking, the role of parties through deliberate campaign finance reform was lessened. And that did in some ways require members of Congress to mount their own campaigns and do their own fundraising. Uh, this is reflected, as we'll see, in some of the issues in elections and campaigns with the rise of organizations called PACs, political action committees, which contribute directly to members of Congress and other campaigns. Before the 1970s, most of the money that went into politics went into the parties, and then the parties conducted the campaigns and funded the campaigns, both on the national level with the presidency and on the local level with members of Congress. But because of certain kinds of reforms in 1974 and 2002, um, uh, the role of the parties was was suppressed, and that was taken over by members of Congress then designing their own and funding their own campaigns. We ironically compelled members of Congress to reach out directly to indirect sources of funding within their constituencies and special interests. So some people suggest that, only, that a certain amount of campaign finance reform might be necessary to get some distance between individual contributors or special interests and members of Congress. There's been another kind of reform. This is partially addressed by Wasaki. The Legislative Reorganization Act of 1970 and subsequent reforms opened up Congress to public scrutiny. And part of that was, for instance, the addition of television cameras to both chambers, 1977 in the House, 1986, I believe, in the Senate and then C-SPAN, but then also the committee processes, which generally when it came to writing legislation, the markup sessions, as Wilson describes them in chapter nine, when the legislation is actually written, those were generally not open to the public. So this attempt to make the, in, the internal processes of Congress more open and visible to the American people so that they should understand what's going on, in some ways it also benefited special interests because that opens up the legislative process to more scrutiny and lobbies and interests are more concentrated in their attention. So some people argue that Congress is a little less just a little less functional than say 50, 60, 70 years ago because of unintended consequences of reforms like campaign finance or internal opening and scrutiny. And therefore it might be better if Congress would legislatively or each chamber change some aspects of procedures so there'd be a little more insulation from funding through special interests or through scrutiny of the public or uh, of in special interests within the public. I think probably Fiorino might suggest that that this might, can some campaign finance reform might help insulate members of Congress from having to run their own campaigns and financing. Um, the last two positions, uh, yes, big reform and yes, really big reform, have in common that these are versions of constitutional reform. The premise of these two positions is, is that Congress is too set in its ways 
too addicted to the kind of funding and internal processes, the rhetoric, and therefore, if Congress is to be restored to its pristine function or its core functions, the reform has to come from outside from some constitutional process. And I divide these into in, 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 subsequently into two degrees or, or kinds. Minor constitutional, although it's big reform when you're tampering with the Constitution, and really big reform. What do I mean by minor constitutional? And, and who advocates this? Perhaps Fiorino might, political scientists like him. Some conservatives, especially with respect to Congress's uh, inability to address the national uh, debt or, or national issues. The argument is, is that they're so bound up with re re-election and campaigning. And this also uh, ties into the incumbency question. For those people who think that the rise of incumbency in the House, the tendency of 92 to 98 percent of members of the Congress, of the House of Representatives, when they're running for re-election, to be re-elected, the argument is, is that uh, that there are so many advantages to incumbency, like financing, name recognition, that congressional elections have ceased to be competitive. And if elections aren't competitive, if if election if the outcome of an election is already given, you could say there isn't real competition. And it's a competition for election and re-election that keeps members of Congress attendant to their constituents. So the argument would be what would solve that? And this is the primary argument for term limits. And many have suggested like a four-term limit in the House and a two to four-term limit in the Senate. And the argument is, is if you eventually put term limits on members of Congress, then eventually in each district, in each state, the race will become an e equal playing field again because you're taking because you're forcing people out of office and therefore new people are running for that office. So some people argue in this p third position that some kind of constitutional amendment, like a balanced budget amendment on the grounds that taking Fiorino's argument seriously. That, uh, that members of Congress won't be able to control their spending. They can't because that's how they get reelected. So the only way to allow Congress the freedom to act on long-range accumulated debt, the argument is, is to pass a balanced budget amendment. Now, there are negatives to all of these things, by the way, and even term limits. Term limits have become a pretty popular idea. And in the 1990s, the second method of uh, initiating constitutional amendments, two-thirds of the state, became very close to initiating a second constitutional convention, although we didn't make the requisite three, uh, two thirds of the states um, to call a second convention, but it was on this very issue, term limits. So um, um, why do people support term limits? Again, the argument is, is, is that would make the House more representative, although that partially depends on how much you answer the question of whether the House is representative of the American people. Connolly would say it's perfectly representative, even in its messiness. But yet the argument is if you forced uh, members of Congress to limit their terms and therefore generated a, a constitutional solution to the issue of incumbency, you would force elections to be more competitive, therefore more representative, and say with term limits and or with balanced budget amendments, uh, Congress would have either the constitutional duty or the constitutional freedom to address things like the long range debt, et cetera. Now, the fourth position is what I call really big reform, and that is uh, those people who argue that Congress's dysfunction is actually a dysfunction of the whole constitutional system, and that Congress needs profound structural change, not tinkering with term limits or a balanced budget, but rather major structural reform. Um, they, these tend to offer structural criticisms of the separation of powers, that the president, as a national leader, doesn't have enough influence or power over Congress because of the separation of powers although that may depend on who's in the presidency at the time, um, uh, or that the term should be limited, as we've already seen, um, uh, and that uh, somehow that, that the presidential election and the members of the House should go together so that you get something like a parliamentary dynamic between the two members, of the, two uh, uh, the two branches of government. And even to some degree, whereas it, when it comes to minor constitutional reform like term limits or... Um, a balanced budget amendment, those tend to be offered by members of the conservative part of the political spectrum. Uh, some members of the progressive part of the political sp spectrum argue that Congress needs profound structural change, especially in the Senate. Because remember, part of the Great Compromise on July 16, 1787 in the Constitutional Convention was that the American people would be represented in the House by direct election and proportional election, where each state would get its proportion of the American people, 
Therefore, the House really represents the American people. And the compromise was uh, that little bit of confederalism uh, that's left in the Senate, where it's the states, just like in the Articles of Confederation, who were represented. And so in some ways, um, uh, the argument is we should change the nature of the Senate and have the Senate based on proportional representation. Why should, the argument is, and you'll see this is reflected also in the Electoral College issues that we'll see for next week. Um, why should the uh, 300 or 400,000 people in Wyoming have two senators and the 35 million people in California also only have two senators? So this would change the nature of the Senate, where in some ways it would no longer be representative of the states in the system, with the House representing the people and the Congress representing and the, and the Senate representing the states. Even with the 17th Amendment's direct election, still the people in the states who are represented in the Senate equally. So um, both sides of the political spectrum uh, may advocate either a minor or major constitutional version, but these are the four positions. And by the way, on this last position, Woodrow Wilson uh, was a reformer who argued that as long as Congress and president were separate, that the that force of presidential leadership wouldn't be able to unify Congress into a truly national body. And he wanted to overcome aspects of the separation of powers. Now, for this last criticism to weigh that, it's kind of a general weighing of the nature of the American constitutional system. And there you have to weigh uh, the question of whether or not separation of powers and checks and balances or bicameralism and the federal state distinction, whether or not the division of powers, which to some degree do slow down and frustrate some aspects of coherent policymaking. I mean, after all, the separation of powers is the separation of institutions. Um, there, the general question is, is has the American constitutional system answered uh, the general purposes of good government? And what would what would replace these these structural checks on power if we were to move towards a reorganization of our government, say, in the direction of a parliamentary system or national uh, proportional system, which would represent majoritarianism on the nation as a whole much more effectively and much more coherently? Those might be true. But and again, raising the question of if you're changing fundamental aspects of the constitutional system, do you get more benefit? Or is there more cost or benefit? That's a large question, and we'll come back to that towards the end of the course.